we have a few questions kind of targeted each of the panelists rather than everybody answering all of the questions. But I want to start with Jim. Jim Yang is the Yan class of 97. Um, and recently purchased a Colson franchise, one right over here at Town and Country. And when I last spoke with you, we were contemplating buying another one as well. Actually, I'm opening up two more. Two more. Yeah. Building them out right now. Okay, so that doesn't go well with my South Beach diet, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, as a relatively new franchise owner, can you talk about the process that you went through <coughs> in identifying and selecting a franchise? Yeah, and so, I mean, I, I think there are different tacks I can take with this one. Uh, I, mean, I, I think, you know, probably most relevant for this audience is probably to, to sort of discuss some of the philosophical you know, underpinnings of what happened here. So, so like, a lot, a lot of you are in school today. Uh, you know, I was really fired up about, you know, you know, leaving the business school here and going off and, and doing some really exciting things. <coughs> a lot of you are going to go into the high-tech industry, which is what I ultimately ended up doing. Um, but what I found after I, so after 90, I graduated in 97, I went to Netscape. And uh, from day one, one of the things that sort of, you know, began plaguing me uh, was this notion that I was increasingly stuck in this rat race. And... You know, you know, you know, the whole proverbial working for the man and you know, getting stuck in a situation where, you know, there's no clear exit unless you're fortunate enough to, to pick the right startup company uh, that hits that IPO pop, right? And so, uh, you, know, you know, I dealt with this malaise for a couple of years and, and, you know, started thinking about different ways to get out of this. And so ultimately, uh, you know, after sort of kicking around a bunch of different ideas for the last uh, several years, I, I had, you know, a minor epiphany last, last summer, which was... You know, one way to sort of get out of this, this you know, rat race and, and try to attain some semblance of financial in, independence, and by that I really mean you know, not so much material wealth for its own sake, but really uh, you know, having the flexibility to do whatever I want to do and not have to worry about sort of my financial obligations. Um, I started thinking about you know, you know, one way for me to get there was to uh, really sort of recast the way I manage my asset portfolio. So to date, uh, I had been, you know, you know, plowing all my resources into what were really cash flow absorbing assets, so things like, you know, house and car. And these are all things that are great from an appreciation standpoint, but don't really throw off cash and are obviously things that you can live off of. And so, uh, you know, this minor epiphany I had was really about re recasting my asset allocation to be to, towards more assets that tend to be cash flow generating. So things like, you know, commercial or residential real estate properties or small businesses. And I thought, well, that could be an interesting way to go. And, and the great thing about this financial system that we live in is, is if you get into a business that can demonstrate you know, reasonably stable and predictable cash flows, the banks will line up to lend you more money, which you can de get, then use to either expand your business or go out and, and buy other businesses or other properties. And the cycle just goes on and on. And that's how you know, people like Donald Trump have been able to dig themselves out of these massive uh, holes by basically using the financial system, the, the lending system, to really, uh, you know, they lever themselves you know, up and up to the point where you know, they have more than enough money coming off of their operations to fund their lifestyle along with the management and operations of their businesses. And so I originally thought about doing a, a, like a restaurant, so something like an Applebee's but more of like a standalone stand type of entity. And, uh, you know, I spent some time in New York and Boston pre-business school, and so there were a number of concepts that I thought that would do really well here in Palo Alto. And the more I researched it, the more I realized the odds were against me because uh, you know, in the restaurant business, as some of you may know, uh, it's very, very high risk. So, so eight out of ten fail within 18 months. Uh, the capital required to open one of these up, especially of the kind of scale that I was thinking, uh, are pretty, pretty formidable. I mean, you know, I was looking at you know seven figures uh, plus to open up something that you know, for, for you know, all I knew, could you know, even with the best intentions and with the best staff, would fail. Uh, and then third, and perhaps most importantly, you know, you know, like many of you, I had no idea how to run a restaurant. And had no business trying to do it on my own. And so I realized, you know, those three things coupled together, are, you know, don't add up to success. <laughs> so, you know, for me, you know, I decided to scale back my, my expectations and my thinking a little bit and, and came to this notion of a franchise. And so, you know, to be honest, I had always had sort of a, a you know, I don't want to say negative, but, but not a positive uh, you know, connotation with, with, uh, with, with franchises because it's something that, you know, from my perspective, you don't necessarily, you know, need to invest, you know, hundred thousand dollars in your MBA education to go do it. And you, could, you, could, you could really just do it straight out of high school, um, and, and, and so, you know, it wasn't something that I thought would be a great way to sort of build my career. But, but, uh, but ultimately, I, I, I felt like a franchise was a, was a good way to go because, um, you know, they tend to be, 
you know, a lot lower risk than trying to do something on your own, right? Because the concepts are proven, right? I mean, there are people who have spent years tweaking the formula to get it to work, and the risk is a lot less about market risk and a lot more about execution risk, right? And that was something I felt like, you know, I could handle or people I, I could hire could handle. Um, how secondly... Did you, how did you end up picking Coldstone? So, so, you know, for that, I, I really wish I could say for this audience that it was the result of a comprehensive and exhaustive <laughs> analysis, but, uh, but it, really, it really wasn't. So, um, you know, I, I, as, when I decided to do the franchise thing, there, were, there was really only one that I really thought of, and that was Coldstone. And, and the reason was because I, I had been to, you know, I think three Coldstones uh, up to, I have been to, I think, three Coldstones up to that point. And every single one I had been to had lines out the door. Right? One was in Honolulu, one was in Palm Springs, another one was in L.A. And, and it just sort of stuck in my mind right, that that was a concept that could do really well up here. Um, and so it's really sort of like the Warren Buffett approach to investing. Right? He doesn't analyze the numbers to death. He doesn't you know, go out and subscribe to you know, you know, hundreds of different research reports. Basically, if he likes the product, if he likes the management team, he's going to go out and buy the stock. And so um, you know, that's how I really settled on Coldstone. And you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I probably would have done uh, you know, more analysis of, of the local trade area, of um, the demographics of, of Palo Alto, um, you know, talk to more franchisees. Uh, there are a whole bunch of circumstances around why I didn't. But, but actually, uh, and we can, we can talk about sort of this, you know, later on when we talk about new or, or, or existing franchise. I actually was originally trying to open up a new franchise in the Bay Area. But um, as with a lot of franchisors, they will actually give you territorial rights. And so, uh, you know, as I was looking for new locations to put a, a store, uh, there were existing franchisees who, even though they didn't have stores, had the territorial rights to the location. So I was really locked out and, you know, really persisted for about six months and was about to give up when they approached me and said, hey, we have a, a corporate-owned store in Palo Alto that, you know, we are now looking to transfer to a local owner-operator. Owner and is it something that you're interested in? And, and at that point, I, I mean, you know, I, the analogy I, I think of here is, you know, you got a dog chasing a school bus, and, and what happens if the dog actually catches mm -hmm. a school bus? Right? I don't think he knows. And, and all, all this time, I've been trying to get a new franchise, and all of a sudden, they said, hey, you could have this one if you want it. And you know, I was really kind of stumped and had to think about it. And, and to be honest, I, I, I had to look for reasons not to do it. I dissected the numbers uh, to death. I, I talked to various people that I trusted. And ultimately, to be honest, I was looking for a reason not to do it, and I couldn't come up with one. Um, you know, by then, I, you know, I had been doing pretty senior stuff in the software industry, and, and, and I wanted to make sure that you know, if I did this, I could go back into software and, and without missing a beat. And, and the people that I worked with assured me that that wouldn't be a problem. And so ultimately, I said, you know, what the hell, I'll just go ahead and... Am I, I'm Mike, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, said, I said, what the heck? And, uh, you know, I went for it. And it actually, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but it's probably, you know, you know, by totally serendipitously the, the best decision I've made, because not only has it sort of gotten me on this path of towards, you know, what I view as entrepreneurialism, but it's really emboldened me to do a lot more things. And from that standpoint, it's great. But, but, but you know, just as a side note, you know, it's funny, like, um, you know, neither my wife nor my, my mom are very pleased about this whole ice cream thing because they're embarrassed. I mean, when people, people ask my mom what I do for a living, she lies, right? <laughs> it's true. She, she does not want to tell them that she raised her son to, to manage an ice cream store. So, so that's one of the challenges I, I run into in my own family. Now, are you, because you mentioned a few of your goals in terms of some financial freedom. I mean, are you on track to achieve some of that in the time frame you were looking? Or? Yeah. So I, I think I had three goals get, getting into this, and, and these tie into sort of my, my philosophy and my religion. But one certainly was financial. So I wanted to reach a point of, of self-sufficiency. And so, you know, my goal was, the Colson at the time, at least here, was as far as Northern California goes, which is Fresno to Oregon, um, probably like number seven or number eight in, in the state. And my goal was, you know, definitively, you know, with a bullet, get to number one and, and really be the top producing store in, uh, in Northern California. Um, and I wanted to really crank up sales. So because they had corporate management in place up to that point, I really felt like, you know, with the kinds of, of learnings I've had in the real world, plus with, with my, my, my MBA training, I, I really should be able to ratchet it up. Uh, and from that standpoint, we've been very successful. So, you know, I don't mind saying that within six months, we, we're now the, the top performing store in California. And, uh, you know, we're just driving it more and more. And I think a lot of the synergies that are now going to be created by opening up additional franchises in the area, I think, are just going to increase performance even more. <clears throat> but to the other financial goal, I think two other kinds of goals I had were, uh, were psychic goals. So, you know, this is really about, you know, being able to derive some level of gratification around what you're doing. Um, I mean, ice cream is fantastic, right, because it's a very sort of fun, very social occasion. I mean, we get family coming in, we have friends coming in, we get 
you know, people coming in on dates. Um, and it's very much embedded and intertwined with the community and has really provided a, a good platform for me to do a lot more of the outreach that I wanted to do. So, you know, for example, I, I've been teaching part-time at Palo Alto High School, right? So one of my longer-term goals is to get back and teaching full-time. And it provides an opportunity to give me the flexibility to go into these environments uh, and do what I want to do. But at the same time, it actually serves my store very well because it just so happens that, you know, from an employee base, I'm drawing from Pali High and Gunn High School. And so it actually... It, it actually works out pretty well. I guess from your comments that you no longer have your day job. Well, I mean, that's so an interesting topic. So, so, so in the grand scheme of things, the beauty, the beauty of getting into small businesses and you know, fr franchises the way you go, that's great, is that it gives you a lot of self-sufficiency and independence to, to do whatever you want to do. And so uh, I reached a point uh, in November where I you know, got my store operating as well as it could, did all the sales and marketing things, all the operational things. And... You know, then got the ball rolling on my other two stores, hired the brokers and the architects, and I reached a point in, in late November where I was just flat out bored, right, and, and looking for things to do. And from a resource standpoint, there's only so much I can do in parallel. So I started, uh, you know, I put it out a couple inquiries, and then before you know it, uh, I ended up in a, in a job that I really love doing. But I've just, I just literally just started this week. But, but I was almost, I was considering whether or not I should tell that to people because I think there's something very romantic about being a small business owner and not having to worry about anything else. But, but the reality is what, it, what it's done is it's given me the opportunity to, to, to do a job that, that I'm really fired up about and excited about doing, and, you know, which is in contrast to previous jobs I've had post-business school where I kind of felt like I had to do it because... You know, I have these mortgage payments and car payments and, and, and just, you know, the whole, you know, all the risk and turmoil of, of, of leaving from one job to another, you know, it just made, you know, life very unsatisfying. Cool. Um, Greg, you have how many Applebee's? 87. 87, okay. Do you know where they all are? I've been to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me that name all. <laughs> well, um, can you talk about how you got to the point where you actually had 87 Applebee's? Did you grow into them, or how did you? Well, uh, both organic growth and acquisition. Um, okay. Yeah, I was very different sort of background. I was really deliberate about it, and I had a commercial real estate business I started out of Stanford in 94, uh, and that was doing fine toward the late 90s, and I was very interested in finding a hedge to it, you know, something that was going to survive the coming recession, whenever it was. Um, and so in 98, you know, I started, and another thing happened in the 90s, which uh, there developed a market of securitized franchise finance for sort of top-tier concepts. And uh, top-tier means, you know, more than 500 units successful. You know, it's uh, McDonald's, Wendy's, Applebee's, Chili's. You know, there's only a dozen that qualify. Um, but what you could do was borrow, you know, almost all of the price of, you know, acquiring or developing a top-tier franchise unit um, at, you know, debt rates reflective of much less risky investments like real estate. Uh, and so in Washington State, uh, where I had some office buildings, um, the Applebee's market came up for sale. It had eight units. Uh, they were not performing well in the existing franchisee who was out of Chicago wanted to sell because he couldn't make any money there. It's a very high cost environment, very similar to California. Um, but I looked at him and thought that we could uh, do better. And I also thought when you look at the life cycle of franchise groups in Applebee's, and this is probably true in, in many concepts, you need to achieve critical mass in a market uh, for sales to really start taking off. So I thought that based on sort of surveying, there are only 50 franchise groups out there, but based on surveying them, that this market was just about to turn the corner, you know, when it got to 10 units, 12 units. A and that proved to be true. So I bought the market, you know, for $14 million in 98, and I borrowed 12.9 of it <laughs> um, at 8%. A and the interesting arbitrage opportunity was you buy franchise businesses like businesses, reflective of the very high level of risk, you know, therein. So you buy on a multiple of EBITDA, in this case, of six, right? Whereas you borrowed, you know, 90% at 8%. So you're getting an unleveraged yield of 16%, and you finance almost all of it at 8 You know, it's almost an instant return of your equity. Um, it's an anomaly that has corrected somewhat since, you know, as most of the securitized lenders have, in fact, gone bust, as they deserve to do. Uh, but you can still, you know, you can still, from legitimate 
banks in the franchise business borrow 70% or 75% at now 5%, right, which is still a good spread for them. Uh, and you're still able to buy franchises at five, six times EBITDA. So uh, it still exists. Someone's wrong, obviously. They're selling too cheap or they're lending too much. But I don't care, right? I mean, I care about the difference. Um, so we bought those first eight. You know, we grew volumes pretty significantly over the years and started building units. And then I started buying other markets in much the same way. Uh, so now we're in Ohio, Indiana, and New Jersey, and Delaware in addition. Now, how involved are you with the management, or how is your management structured for that? You know, I'm the um, CEO, which is the second most important position in the company. You know, the COO is the most important. Uh, and we're set up with market presidents running day-to-day -day operations in each market. They roll up to a chief operating officer um, who you know, is really responsible for a whole variety of things, but one is you know, sharing best practice as developed between all the different regions around the country and the other franchise, you know, Applebee's markets out there. Um, what I do is, you know, strategy, finance, real estate, senior staffing, um, and franchisor relations, which are very extremely important in this business. Right. Now, given your real estate business, how much of your mind share does the Applebee's consume relative to the rest of your... About half. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, now... I'll ask you this specifically, given the, the, the real plan. I mean, do you find that the reduced risk and responsibility of being a franchisee is worth the trade-off compared to being the franchisor? Or? Yes. <laughs> I, I sent her this question because yeah. I think this is the key question. I've seen uh, probably a dozen examples of people trying to start retail businesses, and they get all excited about, you know, how creative it is and all the challenges and this and that. And it is more risky and therefore more rewarding if you succeed. But your chances of success are so much smaller than joining a system like Applebee's where, you know, over 1,600 units, they have figured this thing out. And as Jim said, it's about execution. So our job is very simple. Yeah. You know, we need to be perfect at execution. And, you know, that's a goal I can get my arms around. Mm -hmm. And it's, we don't need to be creative. Someone else is creative. Right? <laughs> we don't need to worry about you know, our competition even that much. We worry about them in a real estate sense, but not you know, in the big picture of this and that. We trust our franchisor. They are, in fact, top quality. And if you're thinking about getting into this, go for the best <coughs> franchise you can get your hands on and pay for it. You know? um, and how do you know which is the best franchise? Well, you know, you would judge a system's performance by the normal metrics, mm -hmm. you know, growth, profitability, uh, market share. Yeah. You know, Applebee's is bigger than Chili's and Friday's combined, mm -hmm. uh, which are its two big competitors nationally. Now, Jim, um, I'll ask all you guys this. I mean, Jim made the comment, and I think it's a common perception, that you don't need to invest $100,000 in your MBA to go be a, fr a franchisee. You can go do that right out of high school. I mean, what's kind of your reaction to that? Uh, it's not true in many systems. Uh, because you, for instance, Applebee's has 50 in the whole world, yeah. right? So they won't let someone who's not already deep pocket experienced businessman in the system, yeah. or person, sorry. Um, in other systems, like the Burger King, I was briefly a Burger King franchisee, uh, and the contrast between the two systems <laughs> is great. In Burger King, it's the old-fashioned sort of onesie, Tuesday, mom and pop sort of, you know, this is your store and this is someone else's store. And it's rife with conflict. There's cannibalization issues all the time. There's inconsistent operations. Uh, there is constant mistrust between the franchisor and the franchisee. The alternative, which was really pioneered by Applebee's and now is probably the more common model, is a development territory, as you said. So, you know, we have exclusive development rights and responsibilities in each of our markets. And we've agreed to build X units over X years you know, nationwide. Um, and they'll hold us to it. Yeah. But we never worry about cannibalizing you know, anyone except ourselves. And we make that conscious decision frequently. Right. Uh, we never worry about the store next door being poorly operated uh, because it's ours and we can take care of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they are, but you know, at least it's our fault. Um, and it solves a whole host of problems. Now, do you, do you have somebody in each market that does site selection, or how do you guys do that? You know, right now, um, uh, Lauren Cortina, who's GSB who's 80, 93, uh, 93 yeah. uh, is doing most of our site selection. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I see every site, too, because that's really my that's right. That's right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, We've, John has been in the franchising business probably the longest of everybody up here with varying kinds of experiences. <laughs> 
um, and has been a franchisee for Sylvan Learning Center. Um, can you talk about what has kept you involved and reinvolved in, in franchising? Obviously, it's been interesting enough to keep you hang, hanging around for a while. Well, or I didn't have a choice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, bought, I graduated in '84. I was working at Hewlett Packard. And the uh, first year was exciting, and after that, the job wasn't passing the shower test. You know, I was just not thinking about it when I got up in the shower. Did, <laughs> did, did not, uh, again, do a, as deep a search as I should. I saw an article in Entrepreneur Magazine, looked interesting, and I bought one Sylvan franchise in Stockton and five more in San Diego. For me, it was sort of an overnight success after about 13 <coughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, Greg's point is very good. I thought I was buying it at the inflection point in terms of the penetration and the national presence of the brand, and I was about five to ten years too early. So I sold my other five in San Diego, retained the one in Stockton, frankly, because nobody would take it off my hands, and uh, returned back to the high-tech industry and have managed it part-time. And luckily, the past five or six years, it has become quite profitable, so provides me a nice cushion when I get my uh, enforced sabbaticals from the high-tech industry from time <laughs> to time. Um, th one of the, the issues I want people to think about is when you go into this, what is your exit strategy? If you're incredibly successful, you don't have to worry about it too much if you own 100 franchises. If you only own a couple, it's a fairly illiquid business. It's pointed out that the ratios you can get, if you get a good cash flow going, that's great, but the multiple you can get is often... Not, it's, you know, it's not what you see in public markets, obviously. It's also not very liquid in terms of your time and your ability. Depending on the number you have, the skills required, you can get yourself trapped for a while in there. Where you sort of, you know, when they talk about profitless growth, you know, you're making sort of enough money and you think it's worth enough that you don't want to walk away from it, but I'm trapped, it's not growing, what do I do? And I would also consider what industry you're in compared to where you might want to be if it does not succeed. So I returned to the high-tech industry and have been there for 12 years, but the first couple of years I had a bit of a tough time trying to sell, you know, what had I learned in this period? I mean, apart from obviously psychic benefits and financial rewards, I mean, what are you developing in your career? I mean, part of it is an industry knowledge, part of its contacts, part of its managerial experience. Now, the managerial experience was incredible. I mean, the first week I made more decisions than I did at Hewlett Packard. <laughs> I mean, it was wonderful. I mean, I had the greatest time, but I was not really developing industry experience, and I was at a time in my early 30s where I would have been developing broad contacts in the high-tech business, which I wasn't really doing. So to some degree, when I went back to the high-tech industry, uh, that five years was a, a, bit of a, a bit of a hole in my career. So... You know, you have to pick something, obviously, that matches your passions, but I would think a little bit about your exit strategy. If it doesn't work, how are you then going to play this into what has to come next if you have to go back to working for the man? Can you talk about the implications of being in a service franchise as opposed to a product franchise? Yes, well, you know, of course, everybody thinks everybody else's job is harder, so I think mine is harder than theirs. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's, I believe it's somewhat more difficult duplicating. I had six franchises, a little bit more difficult. We don't, don't really have a product. I mean, we have an educational system, but the growth of the center is largely developed and based on the director, the person that's working with the parents. They're like a principal of a private school. And to scale that out can be more challenging. You have to think ahead of time that we do... Back to your question about the difference of an MBA. I mean, we have a higher opportunity cost by going to a franchise. And so you generally do have to own multiple centers to make it worth your while, where somebody else might be happy owning one and making 60000 a year. So you have to look at what are your skills to get the first one going, and then ultimately, are there skills you can buy in the marketplace? When the economics of the Sylvans back in the late 80s I couldn't really pay the best educators to come and work for me, and so I struggled. Now, as we've done better, I can now pay people a very competitive salary to what they're getting as educators, and I can hire the best people. And so it's a, you know, it's a standard chicken and egg. You know, would I invest enough in the people? That's hard. This is not you know, a spreadsheet I'm running. This is cash out of my bank account. And it's tough to pay somebody 10 grand more a year when you don't know 
you know, they could leave next month or ruin your business for six months. Uh, so again, there's a lot of areas where it's much, uh, you're dependent on smaller numbers of people, which can make it very good and very risky. Um, I'm kind of asking a question where I think I've heard a lot of the answers, but for each of you, has this felt like an entrepreneurial route or does it feel like you're, you're working for a larger company? Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak for myself and it absolutely feels entrepreneurial uh, along a, a few different dimensions. So, you know, to make that transition from, you know, working for the man to doing your own thing, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a serious chasm you're crossing there. So, I mean, I tell you, the level of exhilaration and gratification you get from, you know, calling the shots, right, and, and ba basically being accountable for, you know, all of the both sort of crucial decisions as well as all the minutia, um, I mean, it's definitely a completely different mindset. Um, from a skill standpoint, uh, there are, you know, I view, you know, getting into the franchise world as an excellent first step towards, you know, building something grander if that's what your, your goals are because, uh, you learn how to do a lot of the blocking and tackling that you I mean you would you would learn anyway in sort of trying something a lot grander. But um, but it's it's nice to sort of you know have you know kind of a, like a little laboratory if you will where you can experiment with different types of approaches. I mean everything from you know the basic things like you know what's the best way to to organize your your entity? What's the best way to uh, you know what's the best way to go out and negotiate really good deals for your payroll services and a lot of your other administrative expenses as well as like how do you deal with with human resource management right so so you know a lot of people told me coming out coming into business school that HR was probably like the most important thing you can learn out of B school and and I and I can I can see how that's particularly relevant in the world that that we live in I mean you the people you hire are probably more mature and responsible but I mean I tell you <laughs> you know it's it, it's a different world altogether when you're you know hiring and staffing uh, you know, high school juniors uh, who really only care about a cu couple of different things, and none of them are aligned with your business. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it takes it takes a while to get used to. Frankly, I mean, you know, I, I I remember. I mean, I would pull my hair out. I mean, you have kids. You know, so so we look at historical sales data and and staff accordingly based on you know weather patterns and, and historical sales. And so we, you're very precise in the number of people you staff. And you have a kid call in an hour before her shift saying. Oh, I got concerts to a ticket tonight, so I'm not coming in, right? And, and you don't deal with that in the, in the professional world, right? I mean, you assume people are going to be there. And, yeah, but, they lie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but I think in terms of like helping you deal with those types of issues and learning and helping, for me, it's definitely helped me gain an appreciation that, that there are di very different types of people in the workforce. I mean, I think here in Silicon Valley, you, you tend to uh, expect a certain caliber of, of person and, you know, you know, I, I think th that doesn't really reflect reality. And I think when you get into a world such as uh, franchises, um, as well as you know, other businesses that you're doing on your own, I mean, I think one of the realities is that you're really dealing with people at all different levels and all different levels of ambition. And so it, this has been really useful for me and helping me sort of, from an emotional standpoint, you know, handle it a lot better. Now, Greg, what advice do you have for somebody who might aspire to own multiple locations of a franchise? What's, what's kind of a good way to start in growing into that? I am. <laughs> I mean, do you recommend yeah, per doing? Perfectly seriously. Do you yeah, recommend doing is, um, one, one to start with? or? It's a more difficult way to do it. And I don't think the rewards are any greater. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can pull it off, you know, by scale and grow from there. Um, there are great scale economies in this business. Um, there is great financing available in this business. Um, uh, let me comment on this point. I think any activity in which you have a 100% interest in the bottom line feels entrepreneurial. Right. And franchising is that. Right? I mean, every decision I make touches that bottom line. And that's no different than if I had started a business where I had complete control over the creative, too. Right? Uh, at the end of the day, that's, you are dealing in an environment where you never have total control over your environment. And we have a set of constraints that are different than the constraints the franchisor feels, you know, but everyone's got constraints. Ultimately, it's did I create the entity and do I live off its bottom line? And that is intensely satisfying when it works. It's intensely frustrating when it doesn't. Right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree, yeah, it's completely entrepreneurial and you own it. You're pay, making the payroll, you're doing all that. I mean, my mom was like yours. She loved that I was at HP. She didn't want me off like being a tutor. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I felt the other way around. I was so much more proud to say I had my own thing. So I mean, it, it depends in part on what your own, own uh, 
direction is. And related to you know working for the man or the, I'll, having watched some of the Iowa debates, I'll use that to get my own sound bite in. Uh, <laughs> that you know, I want to reemphasize some of the point Greg made in terms of the importance of the franchise or. And one of the ways you can evaluate that is many of the franchise, particularly those that have, have fewer the master builders, is what is the franchise owners association? You know, that's going to tell you what the relationship is with the franchise or. Is it adversarial? Are they working together? Because there's you know an innate conflict there. They make their money off the top line, you make it off the bottom line. And unless I've looked, those lines are in different places. <laughs> and so you know their motivation is to get you an increased sales regardless of whether it increases your profits. And so I think it's very important when you're evaluating what you found found a concept is to again find out what the relationship is with the franchise art. So not only meet the people, so you can judge them, because I believe you know, math term, I mean, it's necessary but not sufficient to have a great franchisor. If you don't have a great franchisor, it's going to be almost impossible for you to thrive. If you do have one, then it's up to you, and they give you that opportunity. But that's where I'd spend the time and find the reality. I mean, you can see, are there lawsuits? What's the turnover of franchises? There's a number of ways to evaluate the reality of the quality of the franchisor. But, but just also to qualify, I mean, there are, as mo most of you probably know already, there are downsides to being a franchisee, right? So, uh, I mean, I can't speak for the, for the other ones, but, but, you know, there are certainly, you know, constraints that they impose on the business with respect to the brand and what kind of products you sell, um, you know, the, the kinds of programs you can run. But, and of course, and there's this tax that they levy on you, right? So, you know, I, which I used to wrestle with all the time, right? Because, you know, I end up paying this monstrous franchise royalty to the creamery, which, you know, for the first three months, I would say is absolutely deserved because I could not have done any of that without them. But then beyond the first three months, I mean, the reality is I don't need them for, for a whole lot besides sort of, you know, overhead marketing support. And, and I feel like, you know, sometimes I can, if I'm in a bad mood, I'll convince myself that it's absurd how much I'm paying them. But, um, but what I have to come back to is, you know, none of this would have been possible without them. I mean, you're paying more than just sort of the marginal uh, support that they're giving you from corporate. I mean, you're paying for, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of, for all of the risk reduction that they've given you by, by tweaking the concept, finding something that really works, and constantly, you know, trying to make the concept better and share that across the system. So, I mean, it's clearly there's a trade-off. Um, yeah, I, I would just point out that... In a, in a system like Applebee's, you're, you can view the royalty as payment for ownership of the brand, which is already proven. Therefore, you're buying into sort of an asset they own. I don't look at it that way. And I believe that they do for me what I would otherwise have to do at a much lower cost than, than I, if I did it by myself. So, you know, it's not paying for a past asset. It is every day getting what I need cheaper than I can do it myself. Uh, like market advertising, developing creative product development. I mean, uh, the Applebee's menu is 70% new in the last two years. I mean, they have a huge wow. department that does that. I don't want to deal with that. that it costs so much money to do. That, that, yeah. That's sort of the definition of, is it a good franchise? Yeah. If you're happy that they are doing that more effectively than you can, it's good. We'll see in a couple of years how yeah. you're still feeling and if you're still worried. <laughs> and so in the Burger King system, the franchisees are constantly moaning about how they're pissing away their money. Yeah. Right? They don't feel it's well spent at all and that they could do it for themselves better. They're wrong, by the way, but that's what they say. I'll tell you, that um, on our website, actually, I don't know if Anita's in here, um, but if there isn't now, there will be in a couple of days, a link to some different resources on franchises. One of the things I found when I was kind of fishing around, Entrepreneur Magazine on their website has some really good guidelines on things you should do when looking at a franchise, including questions that you ask a franchisee. Um, so I suggest you take a look there. Before I open it to questions, uh, one other thing I just thought of too. Last spring we did a program, I know some of you were there, um, more from the franchise or perspective. We had... Um, Hilton and a uh, franchise attorney there, and it's actually available for viewing. For those of you who aren't GSB alumni, unfortunately, you can't see it. But Eric Corrector from Lifelong Learning has it set up, um, and you can actually view it online. Again, link from our website, so it gives you a slightly different twist of it. Uh, but before we open it to questions, which we'll do in a few minutes, anything else in particular that you guys want to add? I mean, the, the one thing mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say in closing before we open up the q and A is that uh, you know, if I had known then, what I know now, uh, I probably, if I could have sort of, if I could have cobbled together the resources, I would have done this a long time ago. 
Um, you know, it's amazing, like you know, people in my class and, and you know, all the way down through even like current class, you know, the current GSBers, I mean, it's amazing how many people have you know, literally come out of the closet and say, you know, I'm really interested in doing something like this. But you know, whether, it, it, whether it's a stigma that's prevented them from doing it or whether they just didn't think they could do it or whether people with this kind of background actually go out and absorb the opportunity cost for doing it. But, but what, I mean, I think the great thing is if people now see that, you know, people with our kind of background go out and do this. And, you know, the, the whole package as far as you know, how liberating it is, how exhilarating it is, uh, the, the economics are, are fabulous. I mean, if you pick the right concept, you execute well, you pick the right location. Um, I mean, that alone, I think, is something that people just tend to underappreciate and how, how well these things can do, uh, I mean, if money means anything to you. Um, so I, I definitely think that if it's something that you even have, unless you're absolutely committed to, to an idea or go into a particular industry uh, and you've had your heart set on that for your whole life, I would say definitely you know, open yourself up to doing something like this because I think it combines a lot of the elements that uh, you know, attract us to the GSP to begin with.